Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, good music, mate. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, guys, uh, we're going to have a bit of fun this morning because uh, he's already started at the back of the room. He's giving me, uh, uh, going to make it as hard as we can to get through this smoothly. Um, now, I, yesterday uh, we asked who was in business. Can I just get a check again this morning? Who's actually in business? Okay, who wants to have a business that's not in business yet? And who works in a business? Managers or uh, departments? Okay. All right. Because most of you are in business, uh, we'll concentrate this morning on business strategies and those who want to get into business as well. Now, the, uh, how many have been in business for less than a year in their own business? For up to three years. Okay. Five years? Over five years. Congratulations. You guys are 80% of the business community. Because uh, as you heard yesterday from Jamie, 80% of businesses fail within five years. So the strategies that you're going to learn this weekend will help you get your business to the 10, 25 year mark. Anyone in business longer than 20 years? Excellent, excellent. Okay, um, the information I'm going to share with you today is uh, something that I've picked up over many years from different mentors. Keith Cunningham uh, is a fantastic source of information. He holds mentoring um, uh, sessions and he has a wealth of information. Tony Robbins, who many of you would know, uh, has a, a, a diverse um, psychology of business and the values that, that pass on with that. And also Michael Gerber. I'm not sure if any of you are aware of the uh, e-myth. But uh, the principles of business for us are very, very simple. You've, you're going to be successful in a business. You need an entrepreneur, you need a manager, and you need a, a technician. Now, you've heard they're called different things, and we've seen graphs yesterday about all these different names. The fact is that if you're going to be in a partnership, anyone in a partnership here? Okay. Is your partner got the same skill set as you, or is it a different skill set? Different skill set. So you've been in business more than five years? Yes, and that's why. If you guys go with a partner who's got exactly the same skill set as you, you're going to end up with conflict because, and comparison because you'll end up competing with each other for who's doing it the right way. If you have different skill sets, you'll end up with, a, with a, like a marriage that works because you have to respect and you have to appreciate the other person's way of doing things and the results they achieve. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, all right, now, the, before we get going on the strategies, there's a couple of things that come into play here which are more, uh, more diverse than the standard things. Okay, we have seasons of, of weather, correct? Okay, we have seasons of life, would you agree? Okay, so if you're in your prime, what are you most likely to be doing? Sorry? Yeah, and you'll be growing and developing, right? So we call this the, the this, we have a full cycle. We have the, play, the, the start where we are actually sowing, where we're planting our seed, where we're getting things organised. We have an idea, we have an innovation. Then we get to the, the point of, uh, sorry, we'll, we'll call this um, harvest. Yes, sorry, it is harvest. And then we go to reap and then retire. Okay, so as we are, if, if you're sowing, and then we have seasons as, as well. So if you're sowing in winter, what's the chances of success? Pretty poor. If you're harvesting in winter, what's the chances of success? Right, so we have to do things in the right sequence. You can do exactly the right thing at the right time, but you'll end up with a different result if you're not, uh, sorry, if you, if you do it at the wrong time. So do understand the sequence here. If you do the right thing at the right time, you get a different result to the right thing at the wrong time, okay? You can do the wrong thing at the right time and, get a, and get, still get a result. Do you agree with that? Yeah, okay. There's examples of wrong things at the right time. Right now, the dollar is very high, correct, for, for the exchange rate. So if you, is anyone in importing or anyone deal in, in, in dollars, do trade or anything like that? Okay. There's a chance that you can make a lot of money right now just by 
just because of other factors that are different to your business. While your business is in, uh, uh, no matter what, what you do with your business, if you do something now that involves importing or involves a dollar exchange, you can win because the dollar's high and there's lots more profit than when things are, are bad. So the main thing is also look at your lifestyle. If I want to start a business now, I don't want to do something that has a lot of energy, takes a lot of my energy because I'm not young and I don't have the energy. I have a family, I have time, I manage my life differently. When I was young, I was a bull. I went out there 50, 80 hours a week, 100 hours a week, no problem. But now I do it differently. And anyone in the room who goes through these cycles like I have will know that you'd work smarter, not harder. And this is what you're going to get the shortcuts. The shortcuts come from what you, every speaker you're going to hear today. OK. There's a, the key point of today's speech is knowing the road ahead. Everything we do, everything we do in this cycle is based on the fact that it's been done before. Someone has done it, someone has created it, and we can measure it ourselves and take the shortcuts. The first stage of any business, can I have that slide, Rob? Okay, this is the cycle of the business. We start, we grow, we die. There is a, that's not the case with every business. We can get to a point here where we can innovate and keep going in the top end of the circle. That's our aim. Now, the detail of that is in the first, thing, first stage, birth, new business. Anyone who wants to start a business, this is what's going to happen. You're going to take on the risk. You've got an idea. You've got an innovation. You've got something that is guiding you to give you the source of energy, of focus, of intention, to put your house on the line, to borrow money from a friend, to do whatever is required to get your business idea up and running. Some of it, the motivation, we talked about away from and towards motivation yesterday. Some of the motivation is towards, towards creating something. Some of it's away from, like, I don't want a job. I'm tired of working for that guy. You have these typical situation, mostly in, in the technical world or the mechanics, the engineers, oh, sorry, the, uh, the electricians. I'll go and start my own business. I'm tired of working for that guy. I know what to do. I'm making all the money anyway. I'll go and start my own business and you are managing yourself. It's basically you doing all the work. We've all been there, right? Going to be there? <laughs> okay. Then the business starts to kick. It says, okay, I'm alive. I've got something going on here. And we then have a race for survival. Cash flow is a problem. Well, how, are we going to, how are we going to meet the growth needs of the business? We hire someone to help us because we can't do all the work ourselves. And as Jamie referred to yesterday, it's you incorporated. It's all about you are the business. Everything relies on you. If you stop, it stops. You are in, your only focus is on production. We've got to get this done. We've, and the business is controlling you. All this time, the business is now driving you. And all, as I said to start, cash flow is a real problem. We are, how are we going to pay the bills? How are we going to do this? Because it's drawing every single cent. Most people at this stage are undercapitalized. They haven't raised enough money. They've got a, a successful product, idea, innovation, or they're struggling because they haven't got their models in place and they're running out of cash flow because their sales aren't meeting budget. They've got extra stock, rent, overheads. These are the traps that you can easily avoid when you know the road ahead. Then the business starts to walk on its own a little bit. And as like a toddler, you're just pushing it along gently now. You're saying, okay, take your way, go, off you go. And the business becomes a more of a walk and talk on its own style business. Not so dependent on you because you're there pushing it along, not carrying it or giving everything to it like you would as, as, in the, in the uh, birth stage. That toddler, it's managed by crisis. Things are occurring because we haven't predicted it. We've got ideas, we've got things that have happened, and all of a sudden we realise, oh gosh, you know, we're managing the rearview mirror. We, it, things are occurring before we're aware of them. And so we organise ourselves for a management team. At this point, 
you're very lucky if you can build the management team that's going to live, uh, help you in that business. Normally it's friends, normally it's people you're promoting from within the business to you might take your best salesman and make them a manager and lose your best salesman. You might take your best mechanic and make him the service technician and you lose your best mechanic. At this point we are taking our resources from within and we're putting them into roles that may or may not suit the growth of the business at this point. There's, everything's moving so fast. Everything's moving so fast because we are now just chasing our tail, trying to get cash flow. We've got to do this. Okay, and we're making a lot of away from decisions. How do I stop that from happening? How do I stop that from happening? Instead of how do I make this? What's our direction? Where are we going? What are we really focused on here? What's our outcome for the business? What resources do we need? At this point, we're still in reaction mode. Is any of this relevant to anybody? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now, this is my favourite stage of business. Most businesses don't get past this stage. This is where they fall over or get taken over or they get, uh, or, or they get sold. Okay. This point is absolutely amazing. Who's got teenage kids? Okay. Who was a teenager once? <laughs> All right. Okay. When I was a teenager, I was a tearaway teenager. I knew everything. Gosh, if I knew what I knew now, know now, then, I would be really, really intelligent. I knew everything. I knew the world. I knew everything that happened. And I could tell anybody anything they needed to know. And that's what business, your business will do, because it's making shitloads of money. Everything's working. It's all going really well. You're, you're taking holidays. You've got more time to you have to work at 10 o'clock in the morning instead of 7 o'clock. And... It, everything's happening until you have a closer look and you realise that there's crisis everywhere because people are hiding stuff from you. They're not showing you the reports that you need to see. The information you need to manage the business isn't there because you haven't created the systems to allow you to report. You can't pick up a snapshot of your business when you're not in it and know what's happening. You're not doing everything all the time now. So you can have a situation where yesterday I was... Uh, Rick was sharing a, sharing a story with me about a, a Porsche and a garage and the Porsche engines held him with four bolts underneath. Well, the mechanic left the job, the apprentice finished the job, they put the boot down and said, right, off you go. The guy drove down the road and the motor fell on the floor, on the, on the ground, because the bolts weren't done up. You lose control. You've got a great business, you've got a great product, but you don't have the control because you haven't measured, you don't have the vision of what's required to take it to the next level. So. We, we've got lots of money, we're just wasting, wasting money. Jamie talked yesterday about low-hanging fruit. The low-hanging fruit is where you cut expenses and you increase your profit, correct? Every dollar, every dollar you take off the bottom line is a dollar in your pocket. Just remember that. If you're going to grow a business, you don't grow up by increasing sales. You grow up by reducing the costs of your goods and, re and, in and maintaining your sale price, so you're increasing your profit that way, and by reducing your overheads and costs. More means better. What does that mean? Let's do it. Let's do it anyway. We might need it, so let's do it. Let's, we take on new products. We stretch ourselves to the absolute max because at this point, it doesn't matter. We've got the cash flow anyway. And we look at a bank statement and we say, oh, yeah, look at all that. And we don't realise what's coming in that bank statement is going to be drained. So at this point, you are really, really, really feeling wealthy, everything's great, but you don't realise what's coming. Now, this normally happens, except if you're a dot-com or even now an internet business, this process takes years to get to. But the, the money that flows in now, you, you've got opportunity to get venture capital at this point because you've got a product, you've got a business, you've got something that's actually got some value. It could be up to a $25, $50 million business at this point, but it's still not structured. In the dot-com era, this is where the venture capitalists were coming along. They were throwing money at the people. They say, you've got a great idea. You're going to make me some money. Here, how much do you need? And this is the problem. This was, they've no, at this point, there's no culture, there's no system, there's no management. It's all done with a CEO or the visionary's um, control. So if he says, today we're going this direction, that's where we're going. Tomorrow, we're going over here. Okay. The whole team goes with the CEO, right? We have the go-go leaders. The go-go leaders are, give it to me, I can do it. Who's got one of those? Yeah? The person who knows any, just give it to me, I can do it. And then they don't know when to ask for help because these go-go people, they're the ones who say, it's weak for me to ask for help. If I ask for help, I'm not doing my job. 
So therefore, just give it to me and I won't tell you. So at this point, we don't have the reporting. They're hiding things from you that are important to your business. Your business needs at this point to get going and get, needs the structure. It needs the management. It needs the systems. It needs the, the, um, in t- the vision, your vision, to make it drive. And these people are taking their own interpretation of it and they're making it into their business. At a teenage business, you often have little businesses happening within your business, little departments fighting with each other, taking little bits of, of, of the culture of the business away from the business because at this point it's about them. Does anyone relate to this? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. At this point, of course, you've got great cash flow. You walk in and you see all this activity. You see things, you're big, everything's running, and you are overconfident because you don't have the right tools to measure. You're not measuring your business properly. And at this point, we are heading for the waterfall, right? It's all very nice on the surface, but we don't, we don't know the road ahead, so we don't know what's happening, and we're going to fall over. So at, this, is the, this is why, at this point, most businesses don't get past this stage. Okay? Does, does this make sense to everybody? Is there an example of a business that you can think of right now that's in the marketplace that would be a teenage business? What about Twitter? Is Twitter, Facebook would be beyond teenage, would you agree? They've got their structures in place, they've monetized it. Twitter's not monetized yet, is it? So Twitter's on its way to becoming, in, in just one or two years, becoming one of these uh, teenage business. It's got people, they're headhunting, they're getting, the, they'll get there, but because the model's been done before, we talked about modeling all the time, okay? Modeling is the key. If you can get a mentor or a model that's done it, you will have a shortcut. This whole presentation is designed to give you the shortcuts, to know that every stage is, it's, it's happened before, it'll happen again. So now comes the exciting part. <clears throat> when we become a young adult, we've left school, we're going to university. We have to look after ourselves. We don't have a teacher following us around all the time saying, do your homework. Where's this? Where's that? We become accountable. We have to be self-accountable. We realise that even though we think we knew everything, there's still things we can learn. So our choices become more clear. We actually know what it is we're trying to achieve now because we have a proper structure. We have our outcomes clear. We know, does this meet our outcome or not? We have a management structure in place where we go to the management, know the single defining outcome and purpose of what we are trying to achieve. They don't come off with their own agenda. They do attend meetings. They come along and they, they, everyone is moving in the same direction. We don't have all this, these little atoms running around. We have everything moving as one unit. This is where the structure and the systems come into play. We don't, no longer more is better. We have to, we've learned our lesson there and we realise if we don't consolidate, if we don't make our plans clear and stick to the plan, we're not going to achieve our outcomes. At this point, we might say, look, we did a lot of things right before, and this is what really, the 80-20 rule, this is really where we made our money. Let's consolidate now. Let's focus on what really makes sense. And when we're clear about what it is we want, as we'll talk about this shortly, about your purpose, about your vision, about your goals, this is, this is what a, this point of the business is about. And we are really, really serious. We have serious loans, serious commitments, and we're managing our cash flow better. Cash flow is not a problem at this point because we've already managed that. We've got a good, strong, solid business. Can anyone relate to that? Is anyone in that situation? Is a business like that now? Is, would be probably... I, I would say that uh, Facebook would probably be in this position right now. They've still got a way to go, they're still working out how to monetize, but they have got a very, very sound base and they know their core market, they know their product. Okay, then we get to the Coca-Cola, the McDonald's, the uh, Toyota of the world, okay? These people know what they're doing. The money is just not, these, you have buildings named after you. You have um, whole suburbs of, of knowing your name 
and your, your identity is very clear to everybody. You're branded. You know what you, you, everyone knows what you represent, what you stand for, and what they're going to get when they come to you. You've got a system of management. This is where Michael Gerber talks about McDonald's. In, uh, I went to see Michael Gerber about, uh, I think, eight, nine years ago. No, longer than that, sorry. It was about 90, 96. And uh, I paid $400 the seminar like this, and I walked out of there and I made $400,000 from just picking up one thing, just one thing, McDonald's system of management. And Jamie t talked about it yesterday. You get 16-year-old kids to run a business. So I went back to my business and McDonaldized it. I said, okay, I have to take everything that's in here and make it into something that a kid can do. They don't have to have my experience. They don't have to have my knowledge. This is the absolute key principle to making a business. If you're going to buy a business, you look for systems. If you're going to sell a business, you're selling a system. You are not selling a business. You think you're selling a business. You're actually selling a system. Otherwise, I'm going to be buying your problems, right? Anyone relate to that? Because when we buy a business, we often buy potential. When we sell a business, our buyer doesn't want to buy potential. He wants to buy cash flow. He wants to, because you're asking a lot of money. You've got to have something that's going to reward, something that's ongoing, something that's going to give benefit and value to that person. The team of management. The CEO is no longer in control at this point. The CEO is the head of the board. The CEO manages the, day, the, the overall view, direction of the company, the principles that the company is going to operate by not the day-to-day. -day. The day-to-day -day is all done by your management team. And of course, your sales and your profits are going really well because your management team know what they're doing. Okay, what happens after we hit the top? The only way up is... Right. And we forget what we're doing. Take our eye off the ball, don't we? We say, oh, yeah, this is so easy, so cool. I wonder if, what, you know, why other people don't do it. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. So look, I'm, aren't we just fantastic? We get fat. We get people in there who don't really know what they're doing because the organisation can absorb them anyway. It doesn't matter. We'll, treat, we'll, we'll teach them. We'll bring it up to speed. And we start falling off the wagon a little bit. Our systems that we knew and had a reason for being in place lose their reason, uh, lose, lose their place. When I see a business, I look at a business and I grow a business in small chunks. I see businesses break down in big chunks. Okay? Big chunks. There's 5% falls, 5% reductions in productivity, 5% reductions in profits because of big chunks falling apart. If you want to build a business, by 10%, find 10 1% factors. The factors that everyone considers are not important and add them together and you've got 10% growth. It's easy. It's not a big job. You don't have to go in and say, oh, what do we have to do here? You find the 10 1% factors, five 1% factors, you're growing the business. But if you don't follow a system, if a system loses its relevance, if it hasn't been measured, monitored and modified, and it becomes out of step, out of sync with what the society is looking for. Look, look at McDonald's, for example. McCafe. Do you think they went to McCafe because they thought it was a good idea? Subway opened. Health became a number one issue in everybody's mind. World, the world started focusing on health. And where, what are we doing? It's selling 30% fat burgers, right? So what do we have to do? If we want to stay relevant, what do we have to do? Innovate. innovate, exactly. At this point, if you don't innovate, you will die. Okay? Your systems are breaking down. You don't know whether you're going to continue on this path or you've got to start rejuvenating or innovating. And this is the critical part. Because if you don't innovate, you will die. You will fall down. Can I have the next uh, slide, please, Rob? Okay, ageing. Again, we go back to the cycle here, as well as the, in the seasons, okay? At this point, we're, we've passed reaping. We've done our reap. We're now starting to die. Now, what we can do, after, normally in a, in a farming cycle, you take the reap and then what do you do? You sow. 
So you come straight across here and you stay at the top of the curve. In this case, if you don't at, this, at the midlife crisis and at this point, if you do not innovate, if you do not come back to here, you will only, there's only one way and that's down. Your systems have broken down. Your good managers are leaving. The people who had the, the passion, the vision, the focus with you are no longer there. They must have started their own business. Um, the state of denial, that is, look, yeah, it's not that bad. You know, look, look at the bank balance. It's still good and we've got plenty of stock and our factory's looking pretty good. We've still got most of our customs, customers. And then you realise the reports, you're starting to get proper reporting and you're looking at this and say, gosh, look at this, this isn't good. So who's at fault here? Everyone but me, right? Because you didn't do your job. You didn't do your job because I took my eye off the ball. There is no such thing as big business without accountability. Why do CEOs get paid so much money? Who, who gets the most money in the CEO industry? Who gets the most money? The people running banks. Why? Because they've got the most highly desirable commodity, right? If you don't manage that properly, it's gone. If it's food, you have a waste, that's okay. It's not, as, it's not a real convertible currency like money. So it's not, you can, when, you, when I was in hospitality, we had three things. We had to watch our food, we had to watch our alcohol, and we had to watch our money. Because they are all convertible, all valuable, all highly demand, for, for high, high in demand for people. You take a case of beer, you can sell it to your mate. Take a bottle of, of Jim Beam, you can sell it to your mate. Okay? Buy some extra steaks, feed the whole family for the week. These are the things where businesses get rot. And this is where systems management and structures must be in place. Okay. Then we end up with the GMHs of the world. Or not GMH, GM in the United States. Go to the government. We employ 5,000 people. We must have assistance. If you don't, we're going to shut down. So what do they do? Okay. What did they do to the financial institutions? Okay. Because they are helpless. They are beyond. They've lost the plot. They've taken the money. They got lazy. Does anyone relate to this? This has just happened. We're seeing it now. We're still mopping it up. Because businesses who don't innovate, businesses who don't read the signs, businesses who just focus on Single, narrow outcomes, not the customer, not adding value, not the consumer. They're the, people, they're the businesses that end up as an institution. Now, in a small business, you're not going to have that luxury. No one's going to bail you out. No one's going to come along and say, here's some money. You're not employing enough people to get leveraged for someone to give you money. You're just going to be shut down, probably by your credits. If the system is strong enough, you might just be able to sell the business uh, to someone who wants to innovate it, because you've got a platform for them to build on. If you're going to buy a business, this is a good stage to buy a business, if you've got a plan, a vision, and an ability to innovate. This is a really good stage to buy a business, because it's very easy to get a business from this stage back to prime. It's harder to start something from scratch and build it up, because this has got the systems, the team, the structures, the legals, everything in accounting, everything you need, the reporting, to make your business successful, if you just add the ingredient. McDonald's could have been in this situation. KFC have started a, a program of healthy foods now. If you don't stick to what the people in the street want, you're going to end up running your own business, your own style, your own path, and the, and the world's going to go that way. It's an American guy called Jim Counts, said to me in about 1990, I was in the automotive industry, and he, uh, he came out from America, and everyone from America is going to tell Australia how to do it better. And he said, it's dirt math, boy. I said, okay, what's that? And he said, you look out the window, and you look at the cars people are driving. And if you're not fixing those cars, you're in the wrong make, and wrong brand, and the wrong industry, because that's what people are driving. Does anyone relate to that? Hyundai came into the market in the 90s, right? What were they, the $13,000 throwaway, no more to pay car? Yeah? Look at them now. Now, the Great Wall of China car is here. 
$5,000 cheaper than any other vehicle on the market, no matter what classroom, whether it's commercial or whether it's a sedan. This is the way you... They are innovating, right? They're coming into the market, they're saying, OK, thanks, guys, you left a big door open for me because you're institutionalised. I'm going to come in with innovation. You need all that fat because you're, you've got all this debt, you've got, you carry all this overhead. You're in a bad place. I'm in a good place. Toyota have broken that mould. Ford and Holden went down the same path and Toyota have broke that mould. But that's, a, again, that's a cultural thing because the thinking in China, sorry, in Japan is different to the thinking in America. And the blame is taken at the top in the, in the Japanese culture, not like America where it's taken at the... Everyone else gets it. OK, so you, you don't innovate, you don't... You're not bailed out by the, uh, by the, insti- by the, the governments or your uh, backers, and you die. We understand how important innovation is. I'll just say a word, simple, just innovate. How do you innovate? What would be one of the key elements that would assist you in innovation? Marketplace. Knowing the road ahead, right? Where is the trend? Stay just ahead of the trend, because Jamie said yesterday, what did the pioneers get? Arrows in the back. Do we want the arrows? No. So we stay just ahead. We don't go so far out there that we have to educate people to come and buy our product. If we do that, we're going to waste all our energy, our resources. There's going to be a massive time lag between our investment and our return. Does anyone relate to that? Okay? If you've, you've heard of a ROI, return on investment. If I'm going to put money into something, I want to see a result. I'm not going to I have to weigh up how much energy, how much effort I have to put in. What are the resources? What is the impact on the company? Is it, does it fit with the company vision, plan? Does it have the purpose? Does it meet our identity? This is what we are asking when we make a decision about what we do. If Jamie wants to bring on a new product for the 21st century group, it's got to fit with what? The brand of education. It's got to add value to the people who are part of the 21st century membership. So stay just ahead of the trend. Don't be out there and, and off to the left. Ensure that there's enough upside left in, the, in, in anything you take on. If it's already done, it's already flogged to death, why do it? You're only copying, you're not innovating. You're copying. They'll be innovating while you're copying. You notice how many cars that come out look the same? To, you know, they're supposed to have secret drawings and no one knows exactly what the other car manufacturer is making, but they all turn up and they look the same. Innovation, part of innovation, the Russian space shuttle. <laughs> part of innovation is copying what other people are developing. Modelling, they call it. <laughs> OK. There's five steps to re- re-energise your business. And if you want, I haven't got a slide for this, so I'll just get you to write these down. OK. We bring new voices to the table, new people, new ideas, and we listen to them. We don't criticise them. Walt Disney had a very, very, very successful plan, a business plan. He had what was called the green room, the dream room, where people came and you were allowed to say anything you wanted to say, regardless of cost, regardless of reality, regardless of whether it was practical or not. You were allowed to say whatever you wanted to say in that room. And then he would have those people leave the room. No one was allowed to criticise. No one, if you wanted to add a comment, you would say, and your, add your comment. You would not say, but or no. You with me? OK. What would that do to the culture of an organisation? What happened to Walt Disney? What happened to Disneyland? Look at it. It was the most successful theme park operation in history because he developed a vision. Who else was doing it at the time? So where did he have to get his innovation from? Right, from the people who he worked with, the people who he sent out to talk with the people on the floor in the theme park. How are you going? Did you enjoy that ride? What about that ride was really good? Get some information. Did, you didn't like it. Okay, made you feel sick. Good, okay, we'll slow it down a bit. Wasn't enough bumps for you. Okay, that's good. So you come back and you get together with the information that you've collected and you use it. A lot of people go out and collect information, don't they? 
hand out surveys. Where do they go? Top drawer. Circular filing cabinet on the floor. The rubbish bin. <laughs> okay. We get this stuff. Use it. This is your, this is your, if you know your, oh, get rid of that. Can you shut that one down, Rob? Um, if you get your, um, maybe you could put uh, page two up for me. Um, the, if you get your, uh, your purpose, your vision, your identity in, clear enough, you can create anything. So then he would kick out the, the visioners, visionary people, the ideas people, and he'd bring in the technicians and say, right, how do we make this practically work? And they would come up with all the technical information, all the nuts, bolts, everything, how it would work, why it would work, how they could, do, how they could have slower, more bumps, and make it more enjoyable. And then he would send them out, he'd say to the managers, right, this is what we're doing, this is, these people are going to make it happen, now you've got to manage it so that everyone enjoys it. And the whole, how many times do we introduce something new to our company? Send out a flyer, do an advertisement, and someone rings the number, and the people answering the phone don't know what, you're, what the uh, current promotion is. Has anyone ever experienced that? Okay. We don't communicate, we don't manage it through. So what stage of business would we be at if we were doing that activity? We'd be teenage. Lots of more is better, lots of innovation, lots of growth, lots of ideas but no system. So this is the key point. You've got to have ideas. You've got to have, for innovation, it's ideas. Bring new voices to the table. They don't even have to work for you. You can get an idea and innovation from a seminar. You can watch another industry, not even your industry, and say, what are they doing, and where is that relevant in my industry? Okay? I bank with the ANZ, and uh, I picked up the phone, rang my bank, and they answered the phone. Welcome to ANZ. I thought, how cool is that? I wonder how many hundreds of thousands of dollars they paid a consultant to work that out. So my, my business, straight away. Welcome to Simon's business. Everybody. Okay, still to this day. Because it works. Colours are another thing. They spend oh, hundreds of thousands of dollars on colours. Who knows about the Woolworths and the Caltex um, colours War with BP. Okay? Woolworths went into the petrol business, right? They had the colours green and yellow. BP took them to court and said, they're our colours. They lost. But that's how important branding was to them. The money they spent on, re on their colour scheme. Shell, what is their, what's their colour? Yellow. yellow and? Red. What's McDonald's? Oh, What? Two big companies with the same colours? I wonder why. What does red and yellow symbolise? <laughs> Green symbolises smooth, soothing and smoothing. Red recognises strength. Okay? Yellow encompasses, in the, in the uh, scheme of things, encompasses a balance of all. Okay? You use things that, if I wanted to market to the Chinese, would I use the number 14? No. Okay? I've got a house of sale at the moment. <laughs> and the real estate agent rang me up and he said, oh, we can't market this to the Chinese market because they're the, the, in, in the Gold Coast, the Chinese money is flowing in really fast at the moment. And uh, he said, oh, we can't market it to the Chinese. I said, why? He said, it's number 41. I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, it means something to the Chinese. I don't know what it means, but... Does number 41 mean anything? No. Yes? You'll die, does it? No wonder I moved out of that house. <laughs> Are you sure? I will never sell this house. Anyone want to buy a house? Number 41. <laughs> it's dying. <laughs> All right, so this, uh, this is how important, thank you, for your, thank you for that, because that really is so important. Things that don't matter to us subconsciously matter to all. We've, last night, Rick talked about NLP, un-NLP. The, the, what did we learn? We learned about, uh, and, and even Todd, you know, like, what would I be? 
So we have to be conscious of everything that's going on. Our business has identity also. Our business has a personality. The way that we present ourselves to the business, to, sorry, to the, um, to the public, to our customers, that's really the image that they're getting from us. Now, we have to question that part of the innovation is what questions can we ask to improve our business? The quality of the question really determines the quality of the answer. Do you agree? If I ask a shitty question, what am I going to get? A what? Absolutely correct. If I ask a question like, how can I get to the moon, and I come up with the answer scaffolding, am I going to be successful or not? <laughs> Strong scaffolding. As long as I don't go at night, because I won't know where I'm going. <laughs> uh, sorry, in daytime. I have, to go, keep, I have to go at night. Okay. We can't, also, you've got to make sure your target's real. So, we have new, new people, new questions. With that, we get new perspectives. You want to change someone's feeling, you want to change someone's view of the world, change their perspective. Half full, half empty, you agree? If a person with a half full perspective is going to have more chance of success than a person with a half empty. When in, um, two years ago, in San Diego, as part of the, uh, I, was, I was there um, supporting the uh, youth, uh, oh, sorry, the leadership summit with uh, Tony Robbins. We were sent out into the parks of San Diego to find a homeless person and to change their perspective. That was our task. We had one and a half hours to change that person's perspective on life. The success stories that came back were incredible. Absolutely incredible. I took three hours because I'm an overachiever. but. <laughs> But we had flyers printed up. This guy was gonna, was, had already had a team of people. He went around, hey, you know how to paint good. You know how to do wood flooring. You know how to do fences. And we put a team of handymen together. And they went out with flyers that cost me about $10 or $12 to, to get him started on the computer at the library. And he had a business operating. He had a whole new energy. He had a team of people. He had people he was actually feuding with that became a resource for him. So he made an, a a strategic alliance, if you will. You can help me, I can make some money out of you, so come on board. And the word spread, we had people like running down the street like the Pied Piper, hey, what can I get involved with? Okay, all we did was create change of perspective by putting an ounce of opportunity. Does that make sense? So this is why innovation is so important. Okay, with new perspective comes New passion. He became, he owned it. He believed it. He could do it. He had new voices. I was the new voice. He had new questions. I provided the questions. We had a new perspective about how it could be achieved. And he owned it, so he had a new passion, new drive. You cannot move without passion and drive, correct? It's a great idea. And we, you could have a, oh, here's Rick back. Because, sorry, Todd. Because, Yesterday, Todd mentioned about how, you, how motivated you can be if you just have a thought, if you have an idea. What's a good idea? A good idea. That's where it stays. A good idea is a good idea. What's a good action? Something you take after a good idea. And there's a big difference here. Because everything we do, we know. I'm talking to you about things you already know. That's making sense to some of you, and some of you are going, yeah, 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 when's he going to get on something exciting? The fact is that there is the same, same, same all the time. We know it, but we don't act on it. So we, why don't we act? Because we don't attach a passion to it. We know it's a good idea, but we don't attach any meaning or passion to it. And with that, we can try something brand new. We can experiment. We can toy a little bit. We can have a little bit of fun. While we're making, and it doesn't have to be serious, we don't have to win every time. We might just make improvements. We might try it and stop it. If we did everything and everything we did was successful and worked, would we, we, we wouldn't need to innovate, would we? What do we? There's a saying that's used over and over and over. If you don't succeed first, at first, what do you do? Try and try again. Do you do the same thing again? Do you modify it a little bit? Um, loosely paraphrased, um, the definition of insanity is doing the same action every time and expecting a different result. 
So we have to innovate. We have to change experiment and have some fun. This is, this is what innovation's about. You don't think they sat in uh, Walt Disney Dream Room and said, hmm, I wonder what that'd be like. They went in there and said, OK, let's get into it. Wouldn't it be great? And, and wouldn't it be better? And, and we get excitement. The brainstorming really drives the passion. Next is the new systems. OK, how are we going to implement this? How are we going to manage it? How are we going to make this acceptable to the majority of the people in our workplace and the majority of customers we have? This is what it's about. Because if we're not relevant, if we don't stay relevant to the community, if we don't stay just ahead of the trend, we're going to be wasting our resources. Agree? OK. Anything I've said so far have any value for anybody? Thank you. All right. So it's all very good to have that process in place, but what are we going to align it with? OK, so the questions we need to ask ourselves is, what is your vision? I think I'm running low on time, so I'll just quickly run through these. So write these down, please. What is your vision? What business are you really in? I know the business you think you're in, but when you actually ask this question and you go through the process, you will identify the business you are really in. Who are your customers? Who are your customers? Who are you targeting? Who do you think your customers are? And who are the customers who are really your customers you're not targeting? Because you think you're in the wrong business. Okay? I'm in a business, I have a flooring business. I started it three years ago. It now is uh, arguably the third largest flooring business in Australia. It's because I know what business I'm in. I'm not in the business of selling ser service, uh, sorry, of selling flooring at all. I chose this business because the other guys in the industry left the doors so far open I could drive a semi-trailer in there, be double, and no one knew I'd arrived because they forgot to innovate. Lots and lots of low-hanging fruit when someone leaves a roller door open, I can tell you. Opportunity. I don't know anything about the flooring industry at all. Didn't know a bloody thing. I know a little bit more now. The value is seeing opportunity. And that's the, because I knew what business I was going into. I was going in the business of adding value and providing service that no one else was doing in that industry. You have a problem, your problem. Someone else's problem. We've got so many customers, we don't need to worry about you. If you were to start your business today, would you? Would you? If you were to start exactly the business you're in today, would you? What would you do differently? What would you do the same? Okay? These are questions that I use to rejuvenate everything we do. Because if you don't do it, someone else will. Okay? What systems would you implement that you currently have? When would you have put them in? Would you have done them differently? Would you do them again? What aren't you doing? This, the, one of the things Keith Cunningham actually instilled in everybody was, what can't you see? What don't I see? What don't I see? What is it that everyone else can see that I don't? One of the things about business, which is why the people come to the, the stage where of teenage and they can't go further, or they get to midlife and can't re, uh, can't re innovate, is because they use the same, exactly the same thinking, the same actions, the same uh, out, um, yeah, thinking and outcomes to achieve the result, and you can't, because whatever got you to where you are is stopping you from going where you need to go. This was said, I learnt this in uh, 2005 in South Africa at a conference with uh, Joe Williams. I couldn't believe, I said, you've got to be kidding. I got everywhere by success, by kicking down doors, by pushing things over, by busting through. He said, that's why you won't go any further. Because there's only so many things you can kick down, bust over and push through. Then you have to learn to massage, to mould, to entice, 
to encourage. Okay? So immediately, my opportunities just completely doubled. I, became, I had a whole new threshold to build from. Whatever has got you to where you are now is stopping you from going where you need to go. What technology aren't you using? What systems are you using? What systems aren't you using? What technology aren't you using? What is out there that we're not aware of? Ask your kids. They'll tell you. How do you want your customers to see your business? How are your customers seeing your business? What is the image you want to present? Do you want to present an image that you're damaging society or do you want to present an image that you are contributing to society, adding value? Does that make sense? Now, one final thing. We have, um, how am I going there? Think, oh, okay. Um, another thing that we do in business is we make common mistakes. Common mistakes are that we can often sacrifice our relationship for our business. How many people know successful people, really successful people in business that don't have a family, don't have uh, a, a partner, and, and have a lot of money but no happiness? Does anyone have a... Yeah, okay. This is a common thing. Because the passion, the drive, the focus, the attention, the intention is all around the chase, the adrenaline, the money, the, or the business is controlling the people. They might be in teenage. They might be in toddler. Okay? They're chasing, 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 pushing, pushing, pushing at the expense of everything. So what you need to do is, as part of your vision, part of your plan, part of your innovation, part of the questions you ask yourself is, how does this business or how does my work style fit with my lifestyle? Okay? How does my work style fit with my lifestyle? The last two businesses I started, I chose purely around lifestyle. I love travelling. I love talking. So it suits me. Some people don't like travelling. I, I enjoy it. I have a system, I have a routine, I have a constitution that allows me to do that. So I, therefore, and I also love variety. I love a lot of variety. So having variety in my life keeps me alive. If I was, I'm a very, very poor caretaker. And this is another thing you guys need to be aware of in your businesses. At some point, you've got to hand over to somebody unless you are the manager. If you're the manager, stay right there. But yesterday, Jamie said, if you're the entrepreneur and you're running a business, you, you, the business can't go anywhere. Agree? Because the manager has a skill you don't have if you're an entrepreneur. If you're too technical, you're going to hold the business in anal. You're not going to let it grow. It can't go anywhere because everything has to be technically perfect. We've got to keep the business in balance. So we balance our work style with our lifestyle and we balance the business with the needs of the business. The business now has its own needs. When you get to the teenage stage, the business has its own needs. You've got to identify them. You've got to, and, and you must push through the teenage stage because there, then you have a business. Okay. Can I have the next one, Rob? Okay. Now... When I'm talking to people in their businesses about where they want to go and what they want to do, we have to, if, we don't, if we don't establish this, we are in all sorts of issues because I can come along with my ideas, but it doesn't meet yours. We can come along with a great concept, but if you can't relate to it, no value. If it doesn't meet your outcomes or purpose, what's the value of, the, of the going ahead with it? Because we all, when you are talking and meeting with people, you'll find that not everyone is the same. Your customers don't have the same needs as you. You may, you may have customers who absolutely become raving fans of your business because they, their needs are being met at the highest level. But your needs need to be met also. 
And this is why when we ask ourselves the questions about, would I do this business again? Would I start this business again and why? That's where you find and define your purpose, your vision. Your vision has to meet your needs and values. It has to meet your beliefs as well. We have beliefs. We have, all, we have situational beliefs. We have specific beliefs. We have global beliefs. We have beliefs about business, about life. We have business, uh, beliefs about friendship. All of these things reflect in the way we show up in our business as well. So our business is, has to be our ultimate vision. What is it that I'm in business for? Does anyone know why they're in business? Does anyone have an absolute five point, three point, two point, single reason for being in business other than money? Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to make a difference in my life. I wanted to change where I was and take a step, take a step forward for myself and for my wife and for my children. Okay. Summarising, you want to advance yourself and with that, the opportunity and the financial capacity to care for your family and enhance the quality of their lives. Would that be correct? Okay. Very, very valuable. Very honourable. How are you doing it? Uh, I started my own company hmm? and um, I'm pouring as much... You started <laughs> your own company? started my own company uh, 12 months ago and um, now I'm just trying to fill my half full cup up with uh, knowledge to, to progress my company to where I want to take it to. Okay. So you're less than 12 months or in 12 months? 12 months in March. Okay. And would you, which stage of uh, the cycle would you see yourself in? I'm just born, basically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> not even okay. crawling. <laughs> so uh, you're, not, you're not at U Inc. yet. Thanks. <laughs> just dribbling, still on the tip. Yeah. So it's all about you? It's, it's all about you? It's all about me. I've just, my wife's just gone into the office to, to uh, basically do all the stuff. Yeah, because now you're getting the help you need because it's getting beyond what you can do, right? That's exactly right. There's only yep. so much I can do, and I and I'm, I know I'm not good at uh, I'm good at being out on the tools and and organising, but I'm absolutely useless. Okay, at... so you you would be the technician. Yeah. Yep. And you need a manager. Definitely. Okay. Who's the entrepreneur? That's me at the moment. Okay, that's okay. That's fine. Um, and this is why. Cause, does this make sense to anybody? Do you understand why this man's going to be successful? Because he's got a passion. His passion is to support people. He's not doing, yes, money is, the mo is part of the motivation, but his passion is about helping other people, adding value to the lives of the people in his life, the people he cares about. And he's choosing this as a path of, which is the, probably the most uncertain path he could choose to, to provide support and certainty for his family, but he's doing it because he believes in himself and he's got a drive. Does that make sense to everybody? But I've got a question. Um, if, if I want to innovate, let's say I have a, a fantastic idea that, uh, that, that, could, that could change everyone's life, yet I don't have a model um, to go off and I don't want to get arrows in my back, mm -hmm. how do I launch that idea yet not get stabbed in the back by someone else who takes that idea and takes it? How far way? ahead of the trend is it? So far that <laughs> I haven't seen it before. Okay, Jamie had an, an example yesterday of a friend that copied something from America. Somewhere else in the world is this being done? Is there any example in the world where this is being done? Not that I know of. Okay, how much research have you done? Um, it was one of those epiphanies that just fell into my lap when I was flying down here this weekend, so <laughs> not much. <laughs> All right, so you, it's a, a great idea at this point. And it's hold on to it. Write it down. Get clear about it. Yeah, I've got write, a whole note. Write down <laughs> everything about it, how it smells, how it feels, how you see it, how it sounds. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, I've got pages on it. Has it got already. a shape, a colour? Is it big? Is it small? Is it moving? Is it still? Okay? These is, this is how you develop an idea into a reality. And then we look at it and we throw darts at it and we say, okay, how much damage can we do to it? Where's our threat? Where's our opposition? Who, where's our barrier to entry to whatever we're doing? Okay? How much money is required to make it work? How can we accelerate the process? Okay? 
Lots of money if anyone wants to help me. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> you're in the right environment for, for, for taking that to the next level. If you want to chat to me later, we can have a talk about what it is and how you can take it forward, how you can protect it, um, and, and you, can, you may be able to take it to another level of franchise, whatever it is, okay? Yeah. The main thing is here, know your why. Know why you are doing it. Anything in life, anything in life. Why are you here? Know why. Did you come here just to listen to me or did you come here to take something away from the speakers that are everyone who's going to be talking to you this weekend? Why? Why did you give up your time? Why did you come all the way into town on a Saturday morning after your big Friday night? Why are you in business? Why do you go every day to the same place, put the key in the door and take the same shit? Why do you go there to take the same joy? Why do you go there to take the same benefits and see the smiling faces and have the happy people around you? Why do you do what you do? Why do you go home at 10 o'clock at night and not four o'clock, in, uh, sorry, not four o'clock in the afternoon and pick your kids up from school or play, play, take them out for dinner? Because you know why you do it. If you choose, if I want to take, if I want to imprison somebody, if I want to disempower somebody, I take away their choice. That's all I have to do. You have no choice. You must do this. Part of innovation is choice. The freedom to choose. Know why you're doing something. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. Because it's your time. It's your effort. You're never trapped. You're only trapped if you want to be trapped. Perspective. Okay? The ultimate purpose. Why am I doing this business? If you know that, you will succeed. You will definitely have a higher chance of success than anybody else when you know why. We have to set strategic goals. We just not, not fuzzy-wuzzy goals, like I would like this or something there. We are setting goals that are very specific, measurable, something we can monitor, something we can modify our attempts to get there if we choose the right, if we choose the right measuring tools. So when goals are important, critical to whatever your vision is, because unless you can measure it, it's not achievable. It's a nice idea. It's, again, it's an idea because the actions can't be measured. What's the identity you want to create about yourself, your business? Again, comes back to your vision, your purpose, your goals. What resources will we need to achieve them? Exactly what we're talking about here. What do you need? Do you need money? Do you need people? Do you need a facility? Do you need transport? Do you need to be in a major town? Do you need to pay rent at the highest, at the highest square foot or square metre rate because that's where your customers are? Do you need to be in a Westfield shopping centre if you're in retail or can you be in a warehouse paying one-fifth, one-tenth of the rent you'd pay in a retail environment? What can we change about what we do? When we know who our customers are, and we know what business we're in, we can choose wisely. Okay? The resources we need are there for us. Everything we need is there for us. We think we don't have money. We think we can't get money. We think we don't have the right people. We're just not asking the right questions. At this point, we would need three to five areas of focus that will take the business to, from stage to stage. We go, we know we, we, if we're starting up, we go, for, we go here, we money, we're sowing, we're putting energy, we're putting resources here. If we are in the cycle of the business, we know, okay, we're gonna start here, but we're gonna get to uh, toddler very quickly, very quickly, because we have a team of people already to put in place. We know we resources, we, need. we know the road ahead, right? We've done it before, so we can do it faster. So we don't have to go through birth. We can go straight to toddler or straight to teenager. And then we can enhance from there. The bigger the system we have in place, the better the team we have in place, the faster we can move. Especially if we know what it is we're missing. If you want to make a, a, anything that involves a recipe or a procedure or following a, a set of installation instructions, if you've done it before, can you do it faster than the first time you did it? Yeah? Okay, we've all experienced that, haven't we? So what's different about a business? It's got some mythical, magical thing attached to it, hasn't it? That it's hard, or that it takes time, or that it has to be more difficult than it is. And the next thing we do is we set three, six, 12-month goals. 
Your vision, your purpose is your long-term goal. We have to have things that are measurable. What are we going to achieve? At a meeting, we would sit down and say, what's our outcome for the next three months? How are we going to measure it? How are we going to measure it? Because if we're going to achieve it, we have to know how we're going, don't we? Well, we did it. How do we know we did it? Because we were specific about what we wanted. We had clear outcomes. And then six months we do the same and 12 months we do the same. These are the things that will help you. They're simple things. I know I'm talking very, very basic stuff here. But they're simple things that are the principles we overlook. If I go into a business to help a business, to analyse a business, these are the tools I take. Because this reveals all. You go into any size business with these questions and you'll end up with a very clear picture of what's going on. Ask your staff, what is the, who are your customers? Ask your staff, what is the identity of your business? The people on your front line are sometimes not feeling comfortable to tell you the truth. Encourage it. Create your dream room. Get people involved because the resource you have is your people. If they're not right, help them. Help them find another job. Help them move on. If they are right, keep them and encourage them. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, how am I going for time? I've got questions. Does anyone have any questions? Down the front, please, Rob. Um, with regards to um, going for a traditional business over some other style of business, you spoke about lifestyle before. Um, I watched my father as a young child working really long hours and basically you know, destroying his life to a certain degree. Really don't want to do the same sort of mistakes. What would you say on that? Okay. First of all, before we judge your father whether he ruined his life or not, <laughs> let's, let's look at his needs and his outcomes. Did he meet his outcomes? He did for a very long time, yeah. Okay, so his needs were being met. So he did, wasn't ruining his life. He was ruining the, the lives of those around him, <laughs> but he wasn't ruining his. This is, why about work, this is the work style, lifestyle thing, okay? When you're young, you can get away with a lot more hours. You see, when, if you do the three spheres of influence in your life, when you're young, it's work. Work will be your biggest one. Then it'll, the work one will diminish slightly and relationship will become a bigger one as you move forward, okay? And then self, your time for you, becomes bigger as you get older, okay? So we're always on patterns. Everything we're doing is a, is a pattern, and it's a society pattern or a, 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 we talk about rules, values, and beliefs. The rules, values and beliefs are set by our grandparents who said something to us when we were four years old. Most of us, most of us operate on rules that, and beliefs and values that we've not questioned. They were given to us when we were six years old, between four and six years old as a rule. And when we, when we question them, we then say, well, that's not really relevant or that is relevant, I'm keeping that one. Okay. As far as your father goes, um, that was his choice, correct? You now have a choice. He's given you the gift, hasn't he? Of an example, a model. Do you want to follow that model or do you want to change it? Yeah, I want to change it completely. Okay, just bring that up. Yeah, sorry, absolute change in the model. Yeah. Okay, so what would, what's the first thing you would do? In terms of choosing a business? Yep. Uh, well, my number one focus is the impact on my lifestyle. Okay. And um, at this stage, I'm 27 years old, I've just moved back to Australia, I can see there's massive growth and certainly so many different ways to make money. My question that I'm asking is, what is the, uh, the, best, way, my, uh, the best way that I'm suited to making money, which I believe I'm getting fairly close to, but also what is the best way in terms of, don't necessarily need to have the best lifestyle in the world, I'm more than happy to work you know, crazy long hours and uh, basically establish the situation. Um, but then I want to keep a very sustainable lifestyle from that point forward with the business. Okay. Are you an entrepreneur, a technician or a manager? I'm uh, very much a supporter profile. I'm more of a manager, less of a, a creator, although mm -hmm. I can be very creative and have a bit of a star profile as well. Okay. So you can see, you can see opportunity, so you can see a pattern that you can break into 
Yep, definitely. Okay. Yep. And you can see a system that, as a manager, you have already created a system of how to operate your business uh, opportunity, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm fairly good with delegation, and so long as there's a system there that mm. someone else has helped Who's me develop. Who's going to create the system? Well, I would need some help with the system building, I believe. It's not okay. a strength of mine. Okay, all right. So how much of a manager and how much of a technician are you? Much more of a manager than I'm a technician. technician okay. I'm not a detail-orientated person. Okay, all right. Does anyone relate to what he's saying? Yeah, okay. What the, the, first of all, who... Can't, doesn't need to make any more money. Oh, good on you. I normally get one or two. <laughs> the reason is because you don't have a good enough, a strong enough why to make that money. That's simple. Okay. I agree, I don't. When I think I don't need any more, 27, I, I thought I don't need any more. 37, I retired for the first time. I got very bored because I went heavy into lifestyle, heavy into lifestyle. My business was still teenage. I thought I was running a prime business. Now I know I wasn't, but I left that business. Then I went back and said, I know what to do now, and I created a prime business and I sold it. I created my lifestyle ahead. I, look, I was, I, when I was developing business and growing up, new technologies came on board. Like, we had PC anywhere. You ever heard of that? You can actually work from home and see what's happening on your office computer. Only trouble is you get one hour of work done a day because it's so bloody slow. But at least I had the mindset to think that I was in control. And this is the technologies I'm saying about if you, we have, who's got a Blackberry or an iPhone? Okay. Do you want a lifestyle or a work style? Lifestyle. Okay. Why do you have one of those things? <laughs> you want to get 20% more productivity out of your staff? Give them an iPhone. Give them a BlackBerry. They can't help it. The ding, ding. Oh, look at that. Oh, oh, gosh, it's a work email. Okay? You can't help it. <laughs> you have to start creating some rules about what is important to you. Why? Why do I need a lifestyle? What, how do I add value? And this is, I always come back to this one thing, add value. If you're in business and you don't add value, you won't succeed. Or you, you won't be sustainable, okay? Anyone can come along and make money. There's cash grabs all the time. Get rich quick schemes all the time. Work from home, work, earn a thousand dollars a week all the time. It's not adding any value, is it? If it adds value, it will succeed. Okay? So, what would you do to minimize your work? If first, if you're going to start a business, what's his chances of success if he's starting something from scratch? Absolutely starting from scratch, right? From an idea. Well, I've also um, been very fond of franchising because okay, I work so very well Okay, so you buy franchise, you're buying, you're buying a teenage to, to mature business straight away, okay? Sure. Okay. But if you, is this a franchise you're going to buy or are you going to start from scratch? Well, I'm still making up my mind, but I, I, like, I see the advantages in, in going for a franchise because Let us help systems. you make up your mind, okay? What's his chances of success of having a lifestyle and not a work style if he's starting from scratch? Zero. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear you. Zero. Zero. Thank you. You have to put in the work, the effort. You have to do it. It's all you. Okay? You're young. You can do it if you choose to. You buy a franchise. What are you doing? You're buying a system. You're buying a system. You're buying a system. The system includes cash flow. The system includes management structure and support. You've got all your compliance. You've got all your legals. You've got all your accounting. Everything's organized for you. That's why a franchise has value. Okay? At a franchise, you choose a franchise that you can train someone. If you had a McDonald's, do you have to work it? No. Okay, so would that give you a lifestyle? Absolutely. Right. Choose wisely. <laughs> All right. There's many franchises. You want to be a dog wash franchise? Who's doing the work? You. Okay. Choose a franchise where you take over, where, where you can put people in place. Choose a franchise with a system that allows people to do the work. Okay? Is that... Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot. All right. Next. Rob, over here to the left, please. Hi, Simon. We've been talking about in the last two days um, the importance of, of being able to see trends, pick trends, watch them, uh, and also do our research on industries, our own industry, uh, and other industries. Now, I'm just wondering how exactly you go about doing that, because it's actually easier said than done. Where am I looking? What am I, what, what am I looking for? 
How does it all work? Okay. Yeah. Um, let's start with trends, okay? Trends are evident, they're clear. You pick up a newspaper and you get a, week's of, get a week of newspaper or uh, go to a doctor's surgery and pick up a magazine, okay? And that's, they're always 12 months old. <laughs> Have a look what's in that that is still current today, okay? What is in the news? If you can hold a news story for 72 hours, it's, it's got to be a major disaster, okay? So what, you, the, what the media do is they actually pick up on the needs of society before politicians. So the, you, you, the, and the investigative journalists are looking for things that aren't... that aren't... that aren't fun, joy, okay, because they, who's going to pick up the paper and say, oh, isn't it a great day? Is it, isn't, look at this successful person. I'm really happy for them. <laughs> okay? There's trends. There's trends in society, trend in clothing. Are you, which industry are you in? <laughs> I'm in IT. IT, okay. Um, what's new in IT? What's the next thing in IT? Well, at the moment, uh, cloud computing is, is right. massive. Yep. Um, and likewise, so is uh, uh, developing solutions around IT service management. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, because of the age of the society that we're in and the age of people who are in business, that you have so much upside in IT because you can take people who are not computer savvy. What's the number one thing people say about computers? Oh, I, I'm not really that good with them, right? Young people, no problem. You never get it. You're, you're in a dying industry because they're going to know more than you. But right now, there's plenty of upside because the people in business aren't using the technology to its fullest. Okay, so if I'm interested in, in diversifying and not necessarily remaining in IT, oh. how do I start looking at the various businesses, for example, that I'm interested in setting, setting up perhaps? Um, how do I start looking at what my competitors are doing? Um, where do I get that information? Because if I'm Googling, it's, some of it's there, but a lot of it's not. So Does where am I looking? Does anyone hear what I'm hearing? Does anyone hear what I'm saying? You, have you got a specific or clear why here? At the moment, I'm in research stage, but... Um, yeah. no, you see, you, you don't even know who your competitors are yet because you don't know what your industry is. Yep. So let's do first things first. We identify what's your outcome? What's your number one? What's your vision? What's your, what's your total vision for going into business? Okay. My vision is to set up multiple income streams, uh, predominantly uh, online businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and my vision is to be able to raise capital for those multiple business, uh, online businesses. Okay. Um, is that achievable? Does anyone, did you hear what, what we were asking here? Is that achievable? Yes or no? Yes, it is. Okay. So, yes, it can be done. I'm aware that it can be done, but what mm. I'm asking for is how do I actually start looking? Where am I looking in terms of being able to see what... Suppose that I have identified who my customers are, um, who my competitors are. How do I start looking at how they're actually running their business, what okay. they're doing so right, what they're doing wrong. you're looking for a model. You're looking for a model. Yes. Right, okay. Uh, well, Jamie gave an example yesterday. He went and worked for them. Okay? You, if you want to learn something, you work for them. You're adding value while you're working for them. And what did Jamie say? I need to work for you, so I'll give you my time for free. Okay? So you're saying choose an industry that is in a harvest yeah. or in the in the growth industry, of. There's, there's multiple industries out there. I mean, yeah. they cover the broad, vast style of our lifestyle sort of thing. So you need to concentrate whether it's on an education. Model. Okay, we'll come back to the cycles then. Yeah. Okay, the seasons. The season. If you're you're still in the in the top end of the of the curve. Okay, so. You have to choose an industry that is in, in also in the top end of the curve. There's industries now that are, in, that, that are going into, into uh, institutionalising uh, institutionalization and death, right? They're just no longer relevant. And there are, but if they innovate, they can come back. If you have an industry that is in some... If, look, in winter, what, is winter fun or is winter bad in Melbourne? 
Okay, unless you're a snow skier, right? What do snow skiers do in winter? Bring it on. Okay. In summer, if you are fair-skinned and you get burnt easily, is summer fun for you or not? Okay. But if you are a person who can lay out there and put baby oil over you and fry and, no, and you don't get any sunburn, is that fun? Okay. So it's a perspective. Choose a business that is in a, a season of growth, not in its winter. That's, my, that's why I'm talking about trends. Businesses go through cycles also, seasons. People go through seasons. We just have to pick it. If you see it as, as cycles and seasons, you look at it, is that, is that going to come back? Is a carburetor going to come back on a motor car? Is everyone going to build a new car with a carburetor? Okay. So who's going to go in the carburetor fixing business? Okay. It's dead. So we need to choose something that's in IT. I see that as, an, as heaps of upside. Heaps of upside, because it's continually innovating. So I'll have to talk to you more about your specifics, OK? But the mechanics here, the, the formula is choose a pattern, choose a cycle or season of rise, and choose carefully. Choose something that suits your outcomes, where your skill base is, where your resource is, and make sure it meets your vision, your ultimate purpose. Because if it doesn't align with your ultimate purpose and it's just an opportunity or just a money-making thing, you might succeed, but you won't be happy. Okay, anyone else? How are we going, Rob? Uh, time. time? Okay. One more. Okay. Okay, thank you, guys. Thank you very much.